course, I remember quite a lot, yes. Oh, yes, when I come, when we came here first, there was no sawmills working here. There was just one way back out in the mountains that happened. Well, it was hard, although everybody seemed to to work together. Different from what it was now. Everyone helped each other and that, but those days are gone. <laughs> We used to get home about dark because we had to cart all the logs in the summertime to keep them going over the winter. There is an old tram line going right down the Myers Creek Road, so that would probably have linked up with the... Well, there was danger, of course, but, uh, you, you know, you, you didn't take any chances uh, with, with that sort of thing, you know. And the others were way up at the Dindy Mill and the Grandin Mill. All the other mills had all were gone. In the old days, some of the old timber splitters had come into the forest. They see a magnificent tree like this, and they cut a piece out of it, bring it out, and put it on the ground to see if it had split nice and cleanly. If it did, they'd fall this magnificent tree. The trees were over 200 years old and up to four to five times bigger than this one. The timber cutters only had basic tools such as an axe and cross-cut saws. So on a tree this size, they would probably fell four to five trees a day. Whereas back in the 1800s, they would do probably only one tree a day and sometimes not even that. How they used to fell a tree is to determine which way it was going to fall. In this particular case, this tree wants to fall down here. So with their axes, they cut up what we called a scarf in a tree in the direction of fall, usually a third the distance of the, the diameter of the tree. And depending on the size of the tree, that might, all they might have got done in one day. Then with their cross-cut saw, being the same day or the next day, they start sawing it down until it landed on the ground, and then they cross-cut it into the length that they wanted. That's the same with horses, you know, when it's too rough for horses and that sneak them or too big, you use that, uh, that high cable. We had, a, we had a, a big diesel engine on, on the track and, and we ran out feeder ropes out into the bush and, and, and had them on blocks. We had blocks up on, on big trees here and there and it used to run through that and it used to go out in the bush and pick up the logs. So one of the largest mills in the area, employed in its heyday up to 60 people. We lived in the mill houses and they were pretty rough. We had four rooms in the first one, the fireplace in the lounge, which was good because I could dry clothes in there. And the other mills we lived on were um, mill houses too. The mill was actually wiped out in the 1939 fires. It was a crown fire. It was roaring in front of the main fire. And as I got there, this sheet of flame roared across and dipped down over those spars, shot down under the water. We're always prepared for bushfires when we you see them all around the hills and you think, oh, we're we going to get burnt this time or not? And we'd have a case pack ready to either throw it in the dam or be prepared to get out somehow. Well, it was shocking up here, the damage it was done. Everything was silent, there wasn't a bird. Everything was just black. It was an awful time. And one of the forestry office was burned, of course, to death, and his uh, helper. I saw him bring them in from Tanglefoot, and he yoked them, had them all yoked up into the wagon, and he was standing in the middle with this huge, long handle, whipped and rawhide, whipped and his team was uh, Curly and Piper, Rock and Roan, Rowdy and, and Tiger. And he'd crack this war. His rawhide would crack like a rifle shot just over the top of a hairy hide. Yeah. 
in the mill you do, you work as a team down there, yes. You, you've got the logs coming to the log yard, and then you've got the log yard. He, he, he rolls the logs down close to the breaking down. Then you've got a chap on the breaking down that works the lever that brings the log through the breaking down. And, and if need be, uh, the log yard he will, will do the wedging up for you. That, that, you know, that makes it easy for it to glide through. Just at the exact moment, the, the chap on the breaking down pulls it with a with a cat hook, and it comes down and it, and it whacks onto the skids, and it comes sliding down to the number one bench. And from there, the, when you finish the flitch, the four the four men on that on that on that uh, that number one bench, they go around and they pull the next flitch onto the onto the well, this is the sawdust dump of the old Renton sawmill that is just in behind me here. It started in 1912 or thereabouts, and I started with a 20 horsepower engine and the rip bench and <coughs> they cut the timber to Hairsville about 20 mile on a wooden tram line. We were working up on the Black Range pulling the logs down to the tram line and loading them and then the horses used to bring them into the mill. Up beyond the mill there's people living there. There's about there were about 12 or 14 huts. There's a couple of houses with married people in it. Also a, a boarding house that where the men got their meals. They didn't provide bed and lodging or anything like that, but they just provide the eats and. Uh, there was also a school at this, on this side. There was, oh, about eight or ten children at the school here all together. And uh, the people living here, they were living in the huts, or the men did, all the week. And some of them at the weekend, they'd go to the go to Hazel or more than likely it was the, the pub down to Langy. What they did there, well, it was their business. I worked here uh, in 1935 and part of 36. Stretching from north in Murrindindi to Hazel, there was something like 52 sawmills in the area. We had wooden chimneys and sometimes the feet would get on fire and you'd have wooden burning up the back of the <laughs> chimney which was no joke. We happened to get a house in Talangi for 10 shillings a week rent. Then I used to go up the bush to work on the motorbike from the mill. When C.J. Dennis first came here, he was writing, but he was living in a tent up in the bush. I remember him writing the book, sent him in a book. He always did his writing in the early hours of the morning, from 4 o'clock on till about 10 o'clock. And he used to give up and he'd read for the rest of the day. We call him Pepper. He was the hot stuff going up the trees. He, 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 we always called him Pepper. Pepper Possible, and he'd just flip the rope up and go up and flip the rope up again. He'd, oh yes, he's got the top, you couldn't see him, he looked like a possum up in the top. He'd, as a matter of fact, he'd done it all for the ground and mill. And he'd, he'd stay up there, you know, swinging backwards and forwards until the tree settled down. It was a good life, all the time I was in it anyhow. Yes, it was a really tough life, but we all enjoyed it. We all had fun together, and I'd go back and do it all again if I had my way, and years didn't creep on. <laughs>